a number of highly respected companies, as we all know, have been implicated in corruption and state capture, and the damage inflicted on the country has been enormous. Uh, the guide deals with questions of accountability and reparation. Uh, Cascuvadia asks under what circumstances should companies implicated in corruption be accepted back into the fold. Uh, Commissioner Kiesvetta, who's here, has a very important essay on reparations reflecting on the SARS experience. Uh, Martin mentioned Stephen Van Cole, who's also here. In a way, I think EOH represents the exemplary corporate apology, and he made an important contribution to the guide as well. My question, again, to the four of you is, following that kind of wrongdoing, what do companies need to do to make amends? And how can they go about restoring trust? Pussy? And Gideon, that's important. And I think we, we, we're going to, looking at where we find ourselves at the moment, we're really going to have to come up with a very clear framework. You know, and to your point, I know the, I know the commissioner makes a very um, significant intervention in the report to start to put together what that framework might look like, you know, and what that means. You know, what we definitely don't agree with, you know, at least from the business community perspective, is this notion that when companies find themselves in this situation, then you have to do away with the company, whatever that means, you know. Um, we, we, we firmly believe, you know, and, and I know Lord Peter Hain has, has, has said a lot, you know, about this, I think, in relation to Bain and other companies. We firmly believe that the architecture of business is not inherently corrupt. And this comes out very strongly in the EOH business case. The architecture of business is not inherently corrupt. What is corrupt is individuals within the entity. You know, I normally look at this and I say, it is, it, is, it is so true for South Africa as well. When you look at where we were in 1994, we were a totally different country under Nelson Mandela, totally different country under Tabo Mbegi, and the wheels came off in 2009 during Jacob Zuma, and we're still trying to pick up the pieces you know today. So you, do, do you therefore make the case that you write off South Africa because of the current leadership? I would argue not, you know, and I really think that we therefore, we really need to look at how we define and come up with a very clear framework so that companies who find themselves in this situation and the new leadership teams that are being brought in have a clear set of guidelines in terms of how do we therefore you know, go about making amends, you know, and I think once again in the EOH case, the issue of transparency was very key. It was interesting how uh, Chief Justice uh, Raymond Zondo um, commended, you know, uh, the EOH in terms of how they are the only company which proactively approached the commission to say, would like to talk about what happened in EOH, would like to talk about what interventions we are putting in place, what institutional reforms we are putting in place, you know, what reparations we are actually going to, 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 to put in place. And I guess when you talk about the issue of reparations, I don't know, you know, when I, from where I sit, I, I don't know if there is a one size fits all, you know, in terms of what companies can do. I think this is where we actually had to have to look at the context, you know, and the case, you know, uh, 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 with, with uh, 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 that we're dealing with. But I really think that when you talk about reparations, the one thing that we probably maybe have to agree that should be done is how do we ensure that these companies restore that which they've broken? You know, because then there's a lot of damage that they've actually done, you know, during state capture in whatever happened in the organization. So in therefore looking at reparations, what does that look like in terms of repairing the damage that have been done? And 
do we actually give them the space to can actually do that, you know? And, and to Kess's point, what therefore facilitates, you know, these companies being given the space, and the commissioner to this end talks about, you firstly have to tell us what happened. You firstly have to be very transparent. You actually have to be very open, you know, and lead from the front as the organization in terms of taking ownership of what has happened. You can't actually uh, conceal. So I think transparency is the one thing. And I think the second thing that's already been spoken about, you know, the, the actively doing something about, the company has to actively do something about what has happened in the organization. And I think this is where the CEO is, is, is important. It's not just the CEO though, Kidion. Because I have seen in SOEs, for instance, the tragedy, and I, 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 I say this from my own experience at ESCOM is you put a new CEO, you put a new executive team, you put a new board, but if you are not going to give them the executive authority to turn things around, it's like you are putting these people in a boxing ring with both their hands tied behind their back. It's never going to work. You know, and I think Martin speaks to it, you know, in terms of we are finding with the work that we're doing that it's so difficult to try and get these entities to do what they need to do because the foundation on which they are sitting is rotten. So what does, what does fixing that look like? How do we actually give the right executive authority to CEOs to can really press the reset button, you know, to really do away with all the rot that is within the organization, uninhibited. You know, in, 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 and, and I think this is where the private sector and public sector differs. You know, the reality of the situation is that the decisions of what need to happen in SOEs are not done in the SOEs. Don't ask me where those decisions are made. I don't know. But the board don't make those decisions. It's probably somewhere between Lutuli House and the departments or whatever the case is. But you don't make the decision. So how are you supposed to turn these institutions around? So I think that, therefore, is critical, you know, to say how do you actually give these teams, you know, the authority to can deal with what needs to be dealt with. Because once you actually do that, then you can actually come up with very powerful results, you know, as, as, as it were. In the EOH case in particular, it was interesting for me how the huge pressure came from the major shareholder who actually put his foot down and said, this current CEO, founder CEO, Asha, needs to go, you know, and, and, and they actually made it as a condition precedent prior to them injecting the equity that needed to be injected. You are going to go as Asha, and the CEO that you're going to bring in is not going to be from within the organization. So you see that kind of backing provides the right environment for you as the leadership team that has been brought in to turn the institution around to do what needs to be done because you've got the backing. And I worry that we still have the state capture project so prevalent in South Africa, especially within SOEs, precisely because that backing is not there. You know, the EOH case speaks about the informal groupings, you know, that are there, which which is where this corruption festers. And I think those systems are still very much prevalent within SOEs. And when institutions like the PLSA, on the request of the CEO of ESCOM, you know, fund an investigation report into ESCOM to look at what, how do we gather the data so that we can give you as the SIU to do what you need to do, you know, and then you have government crying foul saying, what the hell? are you doing getting involved in terms of where you need to get involved in? So should the private sector be involved in trying to deal with this or not? Because if we are going to be involved, allow us to be involved in a manner that only the private sector can be involved. And if we're not allowed to be involved, then we should actually have that conversation. Because I guess with cases like the NPA and the SAPS, you know, there is that outcry, you know, and that criticism to say, is this privatization through the back door? you know, is the NPA being captured by big business in this country. Martin and, 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 and uh, Neil will tell you that with the current government business initiative, there is a lot of criticism that we're actually getting, you know, as the private sector to say, why the hell are you propping up a failing government? Have you been co-opted? 
as big business in this country, you know, to actually position these people for elections? And the answer is no, far from it. We have a vested interest as the business community to ensure that this country works. Because this is not government's country. This is South Africa's country. And if this country fails, then we lose, you know, as much as all South Africans are actually going to lose. Dion, just to pick up on that, um, Lord Peter Hayne and I were talking about, he asked me the question, um, Dion, what do you hear on the rest of the continent when people consider what's happening in, in South Africa? So it's interesting, Busi speaks about if, if South Africa loses, we all lose. Um, our counterparts uh, further north look at us with deep disappointment and surprise saying, Dion, what are you guys doing? You were the beacon of hope on this continent, right? Um, we look to you for leadership and all that is good about Africa and what Africa can become on a grand scale. So not only are we letting ourselves down, uh, Lucy, but we are letting others down on the continent as well. 